Good morning. Welcome to Peterborough. Uh, my name's Del Singh, and it's Magical History Tour time again. Um, amazingly enough, um, so many of you watched uh, the first three films. Um, I think we're close to about 100,000 now. I thought it was less than that, but it's actually across all platforms, 100,000, which is amazing. I do keep getting stopped by people. It's not a crime watch reconstruction or anything, but people stop me and say, you know, you're the kind of like Peterborough archivist history guy. In fact, the best one I've had was you're the history homeboy for Peterborough. And I'm going to hang on to that one there, history homeboy for Peterborough. So thank you for listening to my stories of Peterborough, for the stories that make the city what it is. Um, all I can say was, please um, do share, do watch, and more so, do also give us some feedback. Uh, share your stories about Peaceborough because that's really the fun part of this whole thing, is hearing your stories, not just mine, but all of the stories about the rich history we've got at the city centre. And in the meantime, hopefully you'll enjoy Magical History Tours of Peaceborough, part four, city centre, continued. So I'm here on Lincoln Road at North Street, and loads of people keep asking, what is this big building? Okay, I know you can see it now, it's a, a kind of desserts parlour, but what was it before then? Because it's really old and historic. Well, actually, this was the first purpose-built Masonic Lodge in Peterborough. So around 1852, um, Lodge 442 of the Masons used to meet at hotels and various places until this place was established back then. Beautiful old building, goes all the way around the corner, and interestingly enough, the first um, head of the Masons here in charge of this lodge was one Thomas Walker. And Thomas is actually celebrated by the plaque on Westgate, that blue plaque, Dr. Thomas Walker. So he not only became the kind of like, you know, head of this lodge here back then in the 1800s, but he was obviously somebody that was a well-known physician and doctor in Peterborough. And in fact, he's now celebrated on Princess Street by the Thomas Walker Centre, Medical Centre. Standing here on Park Road, behind me is um, a shop that was here for years and years and years, not in this current guise. It was actually Frank Brothers Butchers. Um, and Frank Brothers actually had a really rich history in Peterborough. It was actually Frederick Frank who came over from Germany in about 1870s, um, set up a business. He was a pork butcher. Um, he actually had a really torrid time. I mean, set up successful businesses around 1914 with war breaking out because he was German. Some locals took exception to him. There was rumours that he'd been dismissive of King George V. Um, as a result, he was sent to an internment camp. The ironic thing was his children actually fought with the British Army in the war, so um, it was treated very unfairly. Um, he was released from that internment camp, went off to Leicester, opened up business, but he, was, he died in 1922. However, his sons, Frank um, and Leonard, they actually came back to Peterborough um, and set up Frank's butchers in Peterborough, in multiple sites, Bridge Street, here on Park Road, um, and then later down on Westgate. Yes, in the background over on the left there, you've got the sign you still up for Beals. Beals closed down, but most of us that lived in Peterborough for many years remember that as the co-op. And the cooperative ran for decades. In fact, the cooperative is an interesting concept. The fact that it was one of those things before you had nectars and loyalty cards. You used to get the dividend or the divvy, as we used to call it, the co-op, uh, which meant you get money back for the money you spent there. But you had to have your share number to get your share from the co-op. And... Sad as I am, I still remember from 50 years ago our share number, which is 32004. So once you actually bought your goods, they'd sort of say, what's your share number? And they'd 32004, and they'd put it in the system. I think a lot of people out there from back then still remember their share number. But that was the co-op, and the cooperative was quite a concept. And we still see co-op shops around, but not quite in the way that the co-op used to be back in the day. So here I'm on Park Road, top of Geneva Street Park Road, and again, another kind of family business, something I've really connected to, this building behind me, which became The Park. So opening on the 10th of December 1999, originally kind of muted the idea it was going to be a kind of bar, it was going to be a, a, a kind of offshoot of the Wine King, it was almost going to be kind of like a, a, a foreign beers and ale kind of bar, but uh, that never kind of happened. and. What actually did happen was it turned into um, a nightclub and music venue. In fact, I'd been to Chicago and seen a two-level music venue with live music and club music and decided to bring the model back here, and that's exactly what happened. So it used to be off Walter's Office World, acquired that building and turned it into a nightclub on the ground floor and upstairs a live music venue. It had a beautiful pitch roof, so it was perfect acoustics for live music. 
and with the help of one Mr. Chris Lovell established Club With No Name upstairs and Club With No Name was a brilliant iconic brand that brought bands and some amazing bands, bands like The Dam, The Fall, um, The Beat Biffy, and then also new bands that were emerging like Biffy Pyro and Kaiser Chiefs and Kasabian, they all played here and it was quite remarkable and on the kind of club level thing we also broke some real ground here, some artists, Coolio, yeah Coolio, Gangster Paradise bro played here um, and and Chakadim some pliers and Tiny Temper when he was just a kid he's still a kid but he was even more of a kid when he kind of performed here so it was quite something as a venue um, uh, and some fabulous memories of the park and I, I'd, I'd imagine lots of people who uh, had a misspent youth uh, courtesy of us here at the park here we are on Lincoln Road and the corner of Geneva Street and behind me that red building wasn't always red in fact it was quite an iconic building back in the day in the 1800s that was George Meadows fruiterers yeah they supplied fruits around the whole area um, originally this whole street was taken up with horses and carts loaded up with fruit that was then distributed around Peterborough to shops etc and then in the 1900s they actually moved from horses and carts to motorized vehicles and there were lots and lots of vans parked along here that would again do the fruit distribution so George Meadows were here on this corner, this iconic corner, for decades through the 1800s and 1900s. They moved to Westgate for a short while before they went out of business. But this place, there's some beautiful old photographs exist of the carts lined up along here and even the wagons and stuff and the fruit being loaded down on pulleys and people taking it and distributing it. So this really was a very different hub of business back in the 1800s and 1900s. Here on Fitzwilliam Street, I have a lot, and I mean a lot of memories of Fitzwilliam Street, primarily because of family businesses, but some other memories too, including this place here, which used to be Mansfield Hall Snooker Club. Um, so these doors would open, there'd be a staircase, stone staircase going up to what was a twilight world of snooker. Smoke filled, loads of snooker tables. It was kind of a very dimly lit place. Um, and you know, pretty much it was crowded most of the time and so on. I wasn't very good at snooker. Other members of my family were. Certainly one of my school friends was really good at it. So he would spend quite a lot of time up there. There was a whole subculture up there. Of people that kind of literally lived up there, played snooker. I had a really, really traumatic experience up there, I have to say, involving a cheese roll. Um, <laughs> it was uh, based on the fact that I learned a valuable life lesson, which was that blue cheese, there's no such thing as blue cheddar. It's generally penicillin and mold. So I had a mouldy cheese roll up there. It certainly meant that I never ever ate anything up there again. Um, thankfully, I had a tummy upset, but I didn't have a headache because of the sheer amount of penicillin in that cheese roll. But I don't think it was ever known for its cuisine. It was known more for its snooker than anything else. So uh, that was Manfield Hall Snooker Club upstairs. So I believe it still exists on um, Lincoln Road somewhere. I'm sure they do snooker and I'm sure their cheese rolls are brilliant. So please do try them out. So behind me is 28 Fitzwilliam Street. I spent a good number of years in this building. In fact, when my dad bought it originally, it was just a house. Uh, it was rented property. But later on, it became a shop, converted into a shop. It became super bizarre. Not many records exist of that shop because it was a shop selling clothing, fancy goods, furniture as well. In fact, from here, we actually even traded on the American air bases over at Alconbury and Lake and Heath and Mildenhall. It was an amazing family business. After a little while, my dad actually let the place out. It became Live Music and Piano Centre during the 1980s, and that was the Rutley family ran that. But he took it back in 1988 and opened probably the most iconic alcohol drinks off licence, call it what you would shop in Peterborough, in the area, the Wine King. And the Wine King ran from uh, 1988 onwards. And we did some amazing things here. We kind of like bought in booze that you couldn't buy in supermarkets. The, the kind of, we had literally... I think there was about 100 different whiskies and about 50 different rums and certainly about 300 different beers. There are beers from all over the world before any of the supermarkets got their hands on them. And we had some real exclusives. We had a thing called Sammy Claus or Santa Claus beer. That was a Christmas beer. It was the strongest beer at the time. Um, absinthe. I remember finding all these things, absinthe. 
uh, when it became finally legal to have in the UK without slicing your ear off. It was really quite an iconic. We actually won awards there off License of the Year, lots of other stuff that we did here. And sadly, my dad passed away in 1995. The shop then closed in 2001. And it's amazing. It's now actually a furniture shop. So it's almost like some sort of poetic license where it's come back from being a furniture shop back in 1970s to, you know, almost 50 years later, selling furniture again. So the top end of Sudham Street, going off towards Broadway, you could, it's now sealed off, but you could go all the way through and back in the 60s and 70s, certainly, the shop behind me was one of my favourites. It was the candy box, a sweet shop, but par excellence. You walked in there and there were just jars everywhere of sweets. You'd buy your two ounces or four ounces, a quarter of a pound. Remember, it was all imperial back then. Lovely ladies that ran the shop, beautiful kind of like sort of uh, tabard uniforms, very clean. You could buy pretty much everything that was in there. And that was the candy box, a great shop. And then next door to the candy box on this side was actually what we used to call the trick shop. It was actually a shop selling joke stuff. And I mean, it was just everything. So I remember buying my first kind of fake poo there uh, that I dropped into the bath while my mum was bathing my uh, youngest brother and uh, watching the howls of derision or the, the, the ire that she had, thinking that he'd actually soiled the bath. But there you go. That was the juvenile prankster I was. Um, I did actually buy some stink bombs there. I think I got caught out of school with those, so maybe not a great thing to do, and the nail through the finger. So that was a joke shop here. So behind me now is the library. It was relocated. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the library in a bit, but there used to be shops all the way along here behind me. There would sort of be shops along here, and probably one of my favourites was the stamp shop. There was a lovely gentleman there that sort of sold bags of stamps and stamp albums and really got me into that whole idea of kind of stamp collecting and in fact certainly increased my knowledge of the world uh, through stamps. In fact, I think at one point I pretty much knew every capital city in the world because of my stamp album and stamp collecting. So Fitzwilliam Street had a very, very broad range of shops all along here, which sadly are no more. OK, so this is the site of the original public library here in Peterborough, founded in 1906 uh, by funded by Andrew Carnegie, he of Carnegie Hall fame, New York City, industrialist, steel magnet, cost us £6,000, funny enough. Uh, as a result of it, Andrew Carnegie became the first freeman of Peterborough City here. Um, fabulous building, um, and I believe when it was opened, he actually spoke here as well at the time. There are some photos of that. My memories are of the 1970s, of spending a lot of time, this was before the internet, upstairs in the reference section of the library, and I still love the idea of going up those old stone steps and I love those big columns and everything else that was there. Absolutely love the library. Um, spent a lifetime in here. Um, around 1990 though, sadly, it closed down in this site and moved just opposite um, to a new kind of custom built, modern building. Um, since then, this building has been pretty much used for entertainment. It became Ronaldo's nightclub, Break for the Border, Baccarat, Bar Fever most recently, and now it's being used as a restaurant. So it was Imperial Bento, Bar Char, now the Gurkha de Bar. It's got a really rich history here uh, in Peterborough, and all thanks to Andrew Carnegie. So here we have um, what was the Odeon Cinema when I was growing up, but this place has real history behind it. I mean, I have memories of this when it was, uh, you know, it was originally a one screen cinema, a really large single screen. It was then made into three screens. I had some great memories of you actually sneaking in here to the three screens because you could get in along the side. I had a friend, uh, sadly not with us anymore, who was a little shorter in height and stature, and we could never get into those double A or certainly not the X films. And so I'd often be able to get in wearing platform shoes um, and then let him in through the side door. But sh less said about that, the better. OK, so this behind me here on Broadway is the site of what was Peter's first theatre, the Theatre Royal. Now, open originally as a public hall uh, back in around 1877. Around 1890, it became the Theatre Royal. Went through a number of name changes. I think it became the Grand and then the Empire Grand and the, the Theatre Royal Grand. Um, but it was about 600-seat facility. The curtain finally came down in 1959. Not in the book was the last performance that ran here. And then in 1961, the place was effectively closed down, demolished to make way for Shelton's department store here in Peterborough. Moving forward to 1996, it became part of the Broadway Theatre. So here we are, Cattle Market Road. It is Cattle Market Road, and the simple reason is 
this was established in 1866 as a cattle market there were pens there was livestock there were auctions and that's the way the market ran for many years up till 1972 when the livestock actually auctions stopped um, and that's it so everything kind of came to a halt but the market continued um, and the old part of the market as I know it back in the 1970s it wasn't undercover you used to turn up and effectively have to put up your stall every day so with frameworks trestle tables for me it was an absolute ordeal I hated as a kid getting up on a Saturday morning at 6 to come up and do this so much so that I used to find any excuse to not get out of bed in fact my brothers used to often have to throw my duvet down the stairs to, to get me out of the bed so the site of the Tesco at the moment is was the Hippodrome 1907 that was opened um, and uh, again it went through various guises began the palladium and then finally closed down in 1936 so opposite the hippodrome you actually had what was the broadway kinema um so and the kinema with a k was where the first talkie so this thing played place opened in about 1910 became the goma in 1913 but became the kinema again and in 29 it actually showed talkies there but the real cinema experience i guess was the embassy that was opened in 1937 and it was very art deco in style huge beautiful building inside i have some fond memories of that uh, as a child amazing artists play there so lauren hardy played there morecambe wise performed there the beatles actually played in that building there in the embassy um, i remember going there as a kid on a saturday morning to abc miners and that's miners with an ORS not an ERS and watching kind of like a western and then kind of some cartoons and stuff like that that was a kind of kids thing but also have great memories of watching some bands there too Genesis I remember queuing outside in 1980s to actually buy tickets to go and watch Genesis play in there but the best film I ever saw in there was Jaws Boxing Day 1975 yeah, I remember it. It was Boxing Day 1975, queuing to go and watch yours, having watched that film, coming out thinking, God, I want to go and watch that film again. It was such a good film. But that was the embassy. Later on, sold by Jack Bancroft to own that to Associated British Cinemas, ABC. And it became the ABC. Um, uh, and that was it. And again, that ran for a number of years. And then, obviously, w the demise with the showcase opening, the cinema closed. And since about 1996, it lay empty in about 1996, it was reopened as a series of bars, pubs, etc., and entertainment, which it still is today. So that's actually the kind of entertainment strip of Peterborough with the Hippodrome, the Kinema, and the Embassy ABC. Thank you for watching Magical History Tours of Peterborough. I trust you've enjoyed this latest outing, um, and it's given you some insight to the rich history we have in the city centre here. And it really is rich, there's so much. In fact, there's so much, there's probably enough for a History Tours part five, six, and seven. If you want those, you have to let us know though, and you have to keep watching, please, because we enjoy making these. But you kind of make it happen by actually watching and giving us the feedback that you want more Oliver style. And if you do that, then we will create more content for you to enjoy. So thank you very much.